everyone, Jen here from Field Partner. It's my privilege today to interview co-founder Ross Patterson. Uh, Ross and his wife Christine are the founders of Field Partner, a, a web portal of resources, training materials, courses and coaching for cross-cultural workers in the pre-departure, on-field and return stage of their work. These interviews form a part of a series of interviews that you can find at the website fieldpartner.org. So go over to the website, look under the interviews tab, and you can find all the interviews there of people who've lived and worked cross-culturally. If you want to find out more about Field Partner and the training and the coaching, please reach out to christine at fieldpartner.org. All right, thank you, Ross, for being willing to be interviewed today. Can we just start with a little bit about your early years? Where were you born? Tell us about your family at that time. Born in Edinburgh. Um, many, many, many years ago. Uh, Dad was, uh, came out of the war. I was born in 1943. So when I was about two, two years old, uh, Dad was back. And as a doctor in Scotland, went to engage in a practice in a place called Bishop Stalford outside London, where actually he remained all of his working life. Um, so we moved south to north, uh, to just north of London, and uh, was educated at private schools. That was what happened in our family. So went away before I was seven years of age to a, a school, which was a good school actually. Um, but it, you know, was a lonely time in some ways. Uh, but a caring family. Mum, as time went on, uh, Dad was busy with his practice. Mum became uh, kind of uh, county council chairman and then worked for the United Kingdom New Towns Commission. It was time when they were building all the new towns, Milton Keynes and so on, and eventually became a dame. So there was many, many years later a shocking day when my father said that no longer is a Mrs. Patterson. I thought, oh, no. But what he meant was uh, he'd become a dame. And to that extent, if, if you phoned him up and said, is Miss Patterson there? He'd say, no, she's in Taiwan or Singapore, wherever we happen to be at the time. Um, subsequent to that, um, uh, going back to school days, I was sent to the school that both sides of the family went to in Scotland, um, just outside Edinburgh. And there, the grace of God really kicked in because the Latin master of all people was a very committed believer. The chaplain knew the Lord as well. And they started a very small, well, they started an open group, but very few people went to it for Bible study and so on. And I have absolutely no idea, but I started going to it. Zero background, having felt uh, church is the most boring thing. I can remember lying to my mother and saying I was ill. I don't want to go to church. She went occasionally. Um, and then they, they led me to faith in Christ through a group called Scripture Union. They had uh, summer camps and I went there and found the Lord. It's kind of what I would describe as Alpha. The whole Alpha course was built on the Scripture Union talks, you know, the brief talks and so on. And the first time I went, I have no idea why, but the Lord stepped into my life and somebody said, what do you feel? And I said, well, it's perfectly obvious that we need Jesus. So then, uh, skipping a few years, I, that was my church. I didn't really have church. Didn't know where to go that was live in those days. Uh, but I started going to, um, to those camps two, three times a year and, and became one of the leaders and speakers and so on in time. Went to Cambridge, got into Cambridge, went there, and um, after a bumpy period, because having been to the boarding school, Cambridge was free. <laughs> we, we could do what we want. Um, kind of clicked into what's called Kick You, it's a horrible name, but the Intercollegiate Christian Union, and began to attend that and so on. And for the first year or two, to be honest, I, I wouldn't say it was a double life, but it was... I would go to the Saturday morning, a uh, Saturday evening Bible studies, and then go to the parties. So, would sit near the door waiting for the final amen and then out. And then the Lord just came and said, "Son, I'm your savior, but I want to be Lord." 
and that was a big battle. It had to do with the then girlfriend and so on, so on, so on. But he won, praise the Lord. And kind of that was a big time in my life when I just handed it completely to the Lord and was filled with the Holy Spirit. I had a very powerful, through a guy called David Watson, who was a uh, kind of charismatic leader at the time. And that was a huge turning point in my life. And maybe a couple of months afterwards, I had appendicitis. Dad, being a doctor, popped me into the local hospital. And I, I just grabbed a book as I went in, uh, 1960s early. It happened to be about China. I had no interest in mission, no interest in China. It happened to be about that. And I never read it, but I read the preface, why he went to China. Then there was a BBC 1960s black and white program about the Chinese. And then a nurse walked into my room and said, have you ever thought of being a missionary to China? Wow. And I knew it was the Lord. I, because I just kind of said, okay, Lord, you're in the driving seat now, not me. Um, it was, I can't explain it because I'm the slowest of guys to make a decision. Um, I just knew it was the Lord. So uh, I finished Cambridge, went through theological college, Anglican Theological College, though my heart wasn't really in it. Then went to work with David Watson, Living by Faith. I didn't get ordained. Um, and about a year into that, it was a thrilling time because a lot of people getting saved in York and this kind of thing. The Lord said, I never told you to put down roots here. So I wrote to Brother Andrew and to one other guy. Brother Andrew introduced me to someone in Taiwan. So I took off to Taiwan. Uh, no agency, no trading, <laughs> nothing, just... Wow. got on a plane and went and a couple uh, kind of gave me accommodation because they wanted to go on furlough. They ran a clinic and the other doctor was Finnish. So they said, uh, if you help him, you can have free accommodation. So that's, that's how it started. And the key point there, Jennifer, is a very simple one. I had absolutely no training. Yeah. And no, nothing, no agency, nothing. So, yeah, tell us a bit more about, though, those early days where you'd gone abroad, you didn't have cross-cultural training, but you felt that you were called. How was that for you? Difficult and exciting. Um, I was single, so heads down, two years of learning Chinese. I mean, that's what I did. It wasn't part of my day. It was my day, it, you know, I, I didn't have a wife or children, which I, as I went through this, the classes uh, in a language school, you quickly discovered if you had wife and children, I'm not saying you shouldn't have wife and children because I have one of, one of one and five of the other, but it does affect that early period unless you're doing it together. So I, that's what I did. And uh, I worked extremely hard at it. So came out with a reasonable um, comprehension of the Chinese language and then uh, I have no idea why a guy came to me and said how do you like to do student work so joined in with a group called Campus Fellowship that's like InterVarsity so then because I had a Cambridge degree went to teach in Taiwan University which is like the Oxbridge of Taiwan they have a in those days a radical exam and the top 0.5 percent get into Taida to Taiwan University. So I plunged into the work. Um, I lived alone a lot. Um, first of all, a very kind couple in the Baptist Seminary in Taipei gave me a kind of room below theirs, uh, their house with uh, no air con, uh, no fridge, nothing, just a bed and a plastic wardrobe and a desk. Um, and kettle, of course, for my tea. Um, so that was that was rough and lonely, but it you learnt pretty quickly the do's and don'ts of culture. But having said that, Jennifer, my comment would be: the more you grow and work in a culture, the more you understand you're never going to fully get it, because what you think is one level when you've got that, then you find, anyway, Chinese cultures differ, right? Like Taiwan, if it's a wedding, you give money in even numbers. 
like in, in, in British terms, uh, 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 60 pounds, 80 pounds. If it's a funeral, you give odd numbers, 10 pounds, uh, 30 pounds, 50 pounds. Um, and China would be different. China is a different Chinese culture. So you've got to work it out. Mm. Singapore is different again in the Chinese community. Mm. So you're always, always learning. So, you know, to, to cut back to the question, my conclusion in that was I survived that by the grace of God, but I wouldn't recommend it. Mm. Um, it's much easier to have training in two things, really, uh, in, in some general understanding of culture, that our culture isn't the only culture in the world. In fact, it's irrelevant. Uh, secondly, in the kind of stuff Christy does, member care and all this kind of really important stuff. Um, we, to some extent, survived by being single guys. There were four of us who were single guys. And we had a bachelor society, which was a kind of a joke because obviously single guys are in the minority, but our friendships to some extent as iron sharpening iron kept us going because there were difficult times to say the least. And bizarrely, one more thing, um, one of the strange things that the Lord gave is one of my language teachers who was from Beijing herself and spoke brilliant Chinese, anyone with Chinese knowledge would know that Beijing is the BBC, well, it's not BBC now, but original BBC English. Um, she, her kids are about my age and she just was very kind to me. And I would go around there every Friday, we'd have a meal with her kids, uh, we'd watch TV, you know, it was a social world during those lonely days. Um, it was kind of like a little home to me even to the extent that one day she said, can we go for a walk? I want to talk about something. And all of this in Chinese, obviously. And she said to me, um, one of my older students, says, oh, she was a widow. Her husband had been killed in, an, in a plane crash. And she said, um, one of my students wants me to marry him. What do you think? <laughs> so it was an interesting relationship. Um, so tell us then about the stage of meeting a wife and transitioning to family. So it was quite a vital early days while you're a student. How did you yeah. roll as a missionary? Well, um, I had known Christine in York before I went to Taiwan. She's a lot, lot younger than I am. Um, and so I felt rightly or wrongly, I mean, this is a debatable issue, but I'll speak about it almost objectively. Her family, as you know, Jennifer, you're very familiar with them, is, is four generations of African missionaries. And I felt my call was a narrow one, but a huge one to the Chinese people. So were we, before I went to, to Taiwan and afterwards for the first, say, five years, were we going to be in a situation where she was saying it should be Africa and I was saying it should be China? Mm. Um, I, I don't want to lay down laws about that, but the Chinese have a lovely saying, Xian you yi xiang, hou you dui xiang. Xian you, first you have dui xiang, uh, yi xiang, which is vision. Hou you dui xiang means then you get your opposite number. And I, I don't want to be, you know, there are all kinds of, Ruth permutations on that, you know what I mean? Where you go, I will go. But I felt given her family's very, very strong background in Africa, there could be a problem. And then as she may have said um, in her interview, she went to a Brother Andrew thing and um, he challenged for China. And w when she had the call to China, then, then we kind of connected and engaged and married uh, very quickly, actually, because at that time, if you left Taiwan for more than about three months, you lost your status and had to reapply. Um, and so off we went at that point. And I, I, I don't want to be in any way, kind of, it must be that way, but I, I, I saw folk where maybe one partner had a strong vision and the other one didn't. And that, that's a very difficult thing. So 
however you interpret the xian you yi xiang hou you dui xiang first you have the vision then you have the the partner the, there's got to be a sharing in that um and it makes the choice of a partner extremely important so i've been so grateful that christine has run this at times quite difficult race with me um i wrestled with kids uh in the sense that my parents gave me a very good education i thought well as a missionary i can't afford and even for one the kind of education they gave me but there was a time when praying about it i was actually driving uh, in taipei and and the lord clearly said to me i'll take responsibility for it and uh, i don't know if christine talked about this but um the kids when we were in singapore in singapore for 13 years building up the china work um between times in taiwan and so on um they went to hebron to a school in india and then that because of change of staff got very difficult and a, a, a guy in uh, england um a good school said send your kids to to our school just pay me what you can and debs the eldest my parents as as non-christians were feeling we gave you this brilliant education how come you wasted you send your kids to a school in the mountains of india and actually the eldest debs got from the mountains of india to cambridge on merit and i mean this is what the lord does my father was a good man but just didn't agree with what i was doing um because i was overseas the acceptance letter to cambridge went to him first so that he was able to open the letter and say whoa maybe he didn't ruin their education and god provided for the others uh, most of them went to university one of them decided to be a model and uh, that worked out in god's way because he he ambushed her <laughs> so now if if you asked me to summarize would i do it again the same way now i'd give the t- the kids more time uh, five mm-hmm. daughters growing up uh, maybe i was slow to realize that their relationship with dad is critical at certain stages and at certain stages you know the when one of them was modeling in new york i would try and go through there and held her when she's in tears and things aren't going well whatever or through marriage situations whatever but um i think most men of god would say do it again i give more time to the kids okay so then tell us a little bit about the bible training that you said you set up so you started to train and develop cross cultural workers from taiwan is that right? right yeah we we started three schools about 10 years ago one was english speaking in china Uh, first of all in thailand and then we moved it actually into china uh, which was for folk who wanted to do work in china and we gave them a one year course which is four months class work if you like you know people talking about the kind of thing on the field partner website eight months practical and because we were running a ministry in china at the time um uh, we felt um if people wanted to work with us in china as teachers in bam in businesses mission in uh humanitarian work whatever we needed them to have some training so we did the four months and eight months unit if they survived that and we survived that um then they could join the ministry uh antioch missions chinese church support ministries has two different names Then when I went back to Taiwan about 12 years ago to consult for a church of about 10,000 people I saw that they were trying to send direct from the church so I thought yikes you guys nobody has any experience what do you mean sending people out and you from Taipei are going to work with someone in Kazakhstan or something so we started a school of missions there uh which is um was day school and night school the day school i handed on to someone else who's kind of stopped it in effect but the night school still runs encouragingly and that's it's it's not a good enough course to to go from but it it's teaching people 
bringing in people in Taipei who have mission experience to, to do that. Thirdly, we started one in China about 10 years ago because China, as you probably know, the next great movement of missionaries going out is the Chinese. We uh, Recently, I've spoken to some in North Africa. I've uh, trained some in Dubai. I mean, they're all over the place. And we felt they're going out, but they're not trained. They're doing what I did, but maybe with less intercultural understanding than even I had at the time. So we started a school um, in the northeast of China and it's moved to the southeast and elsewhere, whatever. And that is on the four month, eight month basis, four months of training. So people who are burdened and experienced in mission go in, uh, Chinese speaking people, I think we're the only non-Chinese who do it. And then they do eight months um, supervised with a with people that we trust or under our own leadership work, um, probably in Northwest China, Southwest China, whatever. So again, uh, that model has transferred. At the moment with the clampdown in China, we, uh, if we run it again, it would have to be outside of China. It, China is so tight at the moment that we couldn't do it. But again, whether Taiwan or whether China or whether foreigners coming in, we felt uh, we need to set up these schools and God has, has blessed it. It's been encouraging. But now, um, whether English or Chinese, Field Partner is an online expression of that. Um, and you, 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 people might say, well, okay, you can tell them the facts and, and share the content, but how do you know who they are? My honest reply to that is you don't really know someone who they are until they're on the field, mm. until they're actually working. Uh, I, I think of a sister, um, the first course we ever did about 10 years ago, two things stood out to me. One is a leader of 50,000 believers in China, uh, House Church Network. As Christine taught on member care, he said, oh, see that one Ming Bai Lao, now I understand. He said, I sent 24 people from Northeast China to Northwest China, and I have no idea where any of the bar are. <laughs> we said, uh, you're, supposed to, <laughs> you're supposed to care for them. Um, but the second thing was, there was a girl that, you know, sometimes Jennifer, you're looking at a group of students or whatever, and one stands out. That there is something the Holy Spirit is saying about her, and um, she she went through the class and then went to work with a Singaporean based work uh, somewhere around the middle of China. Uh, a guy that we know well, who's is a, a great leader. And a few years later, she came to me, and this is what she said. You didn't know while I was in the school, I was living two completely different lives. <laughs> one in the school, one with my boyfriend. And it was only when I went to the to work under someone in the eight month period that I got knocked into shape. So mm -hmm. my my assessment is what we want to do with Field Partner is as much as we can give people the understanding and the tools that you can survive the very difficult first years that some mission work involves and then help them to find somewhere where they can be accountable. That, that's a huge word for me. There is no word for accountable in the Chinese language. It's very interesting. I've, I've asked all sorts of people and they say, oh, when's all of this? It, it's not the same thing at all. And also what it means in Taiwan, it doesn't mean in China. In other words, to say, go and work under this leader and learn under them and allow them to speak into your life. That mm -hmm. phase, that eight month phase is critical after the four months. So field partner can't do that second part, but we we want to engage with folk, Christine running this um, um, kind of tutorial thing that she wants to set up with, with people who've been on the field or want to go on the field or are on the field. Um, we, we want to help folk um, because it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. If you said to me, how did you survive Ross? I actually have no idea about 
four years ago, a guy, a guy phoned me up. He, he was a, a professor of um, electrical engineering. And he said, uh, because the, no matter that he's a professor and he's 60 years old, he still calls me teacher. Uh, that's part of the culture. And he said, teacher, um, we are having a 40 year graduation celebration. So it's 44 years since I taught them because I taught them in their first year. And he said, uh, we'd like you to be there. And I said, well, that's great. And he was a believer and he picked me up. And we had a great time. And, and after we were in some guy's apartment and it was quite ritzy and he was showing people around, his wife was around the apartment. And this guy comes up to me and says, Lao Shu, I'm going to teacher, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, sure. He said, how come you're still saying the same thing 44 years later? I, how come you're still walking with Jesus and talking about him? Mm. Do you know, Jennifer, I thought, yeah, I never thought about that. But there's only one answer, is the grace of God. But mm. the grace of God is helped if you have a much better foundation than I ever had. Um, because the early mistakes, the early collisions, and they will be because people behave in a way you don't think they should and you're offending them, uh, wouldn't take place. So that's roughly what we're trying to do with Field Partner. Mm, brilliant. So tell us quickly, like, what kind of things are on the site and why would people come across to Field Partner right now? Well, the vision for Field Partner is simple. For folk who haven't yet gone but want to understand about mission, for folk who are on the field and suddenly discovered actually this cross-cultural thing is more serious than they thought it was, or for sending churches, because sending churches, like the one I described in Taipei, how on earth are you going to send someone out if you have zero cross-cultural experience? So we're trying to meet the needs of those three groups by Christine's teaching on cross-cultural material, by... Uh, my material, apart from the Antioch series, which is about how mission works and how it doesn't in churches, but uh, my material is geared towards trying to give a foundation of what do you need before you go, because that's important. Mm -hmm. um, so for those three groups, we, we want materials that either us or other people have provided. We're doing a, a parallel Chinese one, but that's a, a different world, obviously, for mainland Chinese and for Taiwanese. Um, but our, our vision and our heart is to say, look, if you feel you might want to go and you have no idea what it means, come to our site and have a look. If you're on the field and it's going pear-shaped, listen to Christine's material and find out you're not unique. Uh, but what can you learn? If you're sending someone, please have... Uh, years ago, a large church in England said, would you come for a day and, and consult for us on our missions program? Because people say we're sending people, we don't have a program. And I basically said, okay, you believe in worship at big church, so you have a worship uh, pastor. You believe in Sunday school, so you have a Sunday school pastor. You believe in, in leadership, so you have a lead pastor and so on you clearly don't believe in mission because you don't have a missions pastor. And I said, if you want to do this seriously, here's what I require of you, that you produce someone who has at least five years of experience on the field and you put them in simply to care for the missionaries you send. Unbelievably, they actually did it. But my point was, please don't ask a pastor who's running the Alpha course to be missions pastor because he'll ignore all the past, all the missionaries. Mm. Have someone, you know the expression, set a thief to catch a thief. Mm. Um, if, if you want to catch a thief, you need to ask a thief, how do you think he's going to break into the house? Mm. If you want to help missionaries, when they talk to me or to Christine, we know exactly what they're talking about. We mm. saw a beloved sister yesterday who's worked in China and worked uh, in, in somewhere in the Middle East and so on. But she talks to us about the loneliness of coming back to England. And we know exactly what she's talking about because we've been there. Mm. Um, a pastor who's never left Blackpool or whatever, is not going to understand that. I mean, you would understand it because your family's, your family's been in Burundi. So, mm. you know, my, my, my plea, if any church is going to take it seriously, 
either just hand the whole thing over to an agency or get someone who knows what it is to care for the people you're sending out. Mm. Amazing. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I think we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, but as we said at the beginning, if you would like to see the other interviews, including the interview of Ross's wife, Christine, just head over to the Field Partner website, fieldpartner.org, and under the interview tab, you can see all the interviews there. If you'd like to follow the news of Field Partner, just make sure you like the Facebook page. You can subscribe to the email to get our monthly updates. Um, that's all for today, and thank you very much, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next interview.